Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and people shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and shall decide for strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all the people walk each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I have afflicted, and the lame I will make the remnant, and those who are cast off, a strong nation, and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. God. Let's pray. Father God, we know in this passage that you call your church the mountain of the Lord. And therefore, every time we gather together, we are like Moses going up on the mountain. And Moses prayed to see your face on the mountain. And so today, God, we pray you would show us your face. Show us the face of Jesus in this passage. And uh, we remember that Christ himself said, apart from him, we can do nothing. So, Lord, we are totally dependent upon you now to show us your face, but we believe you will, you will do it. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Since October of 1990... When we moved to the Soviet Union and raised our six children there till now, we've never met a worse moral and human tragedy and disaster than Russia's war with Ukraine. Those of us that have given our lives to bringing the gospel to the 250 million Russian-speaking people of the former Soviet Union, of course, are shocked by the Russian government's invasion and grieved by the fact that so many of the Russian people are for, are for this war, if, you, if you've been watching the news, it's, it's true. Even though most of the 25 churches that we work with and their 3,000 members that are in our movement are holding themselves together, the church that Kathy and I planted starting in 1991 has really been decimated by the effects of the war. Two faithful families in it have fled the country to avoid serving in the army. Another family is considering leaving the church because they are for the war and can't believe three people in the church were arrested for protesting the conflict, the war. The church is now half the size it was before the invasion. They've lost about half their people for various reasons. I have two sons, as I just said. I have two sons living in Russia as long-term missionaries, and now both don't know if they will be able to move back after leaving. We have, a, we have property there that I just showed you on the slide, and we don't know if we'll be able to keep that. They've threatened uh, to uh, confiscate property of foreigners, right? These things led to one of my two sons coming up to me just a few days ago and sobbing so long and so hard on my shoulder that I had to call the rest of the family in just to try to comfort him. So it's been, for some of us, it's just been devastating. Even some of the pastors in our movement have been for the war, at least initially, for the war. We may have, uh, and some of them may have to leave our movement if they keep up some of their behavior. At times like this, it can seem that our 33 years of living and ministering in Russia have almost been in vain. 
And yet, and yet, I have the audacity to read and preach a passage of Scripture, Micah 4, 1 through 7, that promises world peace, in which we all beat our swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks, and that everyone is, everything is going to work out great here in this life and this world. At best, I'm out of touch with the reality. At worst, I am what my children have thought all along, deranged. <laughs> but you know, someone else was out of touch with reality. I don't know if you've heard of him or not. I just drove on his street yesterday going to the zoo. <laughs> his name was Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And on August 28th, 1963, he gave a message. He really preached a sermon on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial to 250,000 people. Is that slide up? Yes, it is. Very good. Dr. King, Dr. King quoted Amos 5.24, and I can't do it like he did it, uh, sorry to say, but he, he did it much better than I can. But let justice run down like water and righteousness like an overflowing stream, right? The reason that that speech of Dr. King's was so audacious was that at the time, the United States was very much a place of injustice for black Americans, and it was enshrined into law. And I am personally connected to some of that injustice. At the time of the speech, I was five years old and lived in the D.C. area because my father, Graham Purcell, was a U.S. congressman representing North Texas in Congress. The next year, in 1964, he, along with almost all of the Texas congressmen, all of them Democrats, voted against the Civil Rights Act, which is just bizarre. That act gave basic rights for African Americans to be able to stay in a motel and use the bus, have uh, schools of their choice, and go, go to restaurants of their choice. And is my picture up there? Is the picture up there? There I am advising the president to avoid Vietnam. You can see how much attention he was paying to me. So, uh, yeah, he, uh, I remember my dad teaching me, when you meet the president, uh, Blake, you put your hand up like this and say, how do you do, sir, Mr. President, sir? I'm very glad to meet you, sir. I still remember that. So, there you go. But in the midst of that kind of legislative and cultural degradation, Dr. King had a wonderful dream of how the world could be. And why was Dr. King so inspired by the Old Testament prophets? I believe it is because like Micah, he lived in a time of great darkness, but knew that God was greater than that darkness. And today we have read Micah 4, 1 through 7, a text in which the prophet, the mouthpiece, the mouthpiece of the living God, was actually saying and sharing, pronouncing Jehovah's, the God of Israel's, I have a dream speech, okay? I believe that Micah 4, 1 through 7 is God's, I have a dream speech. And therefore, even though our 33-year-long ministry in Russia with 25 churches numbering more than 3,000 people, stretching across nine time zones, is now being beaten down and divided and confused, and maybe evening there's a hardening of their hearts to the Lord going on amongst some of them, as I mentioned in the slideshow. God has a dream for them and for you and I and for the Ukraine and for Russia. Even though thousands are dying and four million have fled. Can you imagine? Four million people have fled? That's the size of Dallas-Fort Worth. There's about five or seven million there. Okay, it's the size of Dallas, let's say. And it seems like all is lost. God has a dream for this world. And that dream is Micah 4, 1 through 7, what we just read. I invite you right now to enter into that dream, for it is a dream for all people everywhere and for all times. I'd like us to explore God's dream through a series of five C's. And I only take about an hour on each point, so don't worry. We'll... Before the, sun goes, before the sun goes down, we'll be out of here, I promise. I'm the son of a Texas Democrat, so I can go on a while. But uh, I won't, I won't, I promise. So he have, here we have five C's. The chronos of the dream, the characters of the dream, the calling of the dream, the cost of the dream, and the cross of the dream. 
First of all, the chronos of the dream. The dream begins with, in the latter days. Chronos is one Greek word for time. It's quantity of time. Micah was prophesying about uh, during Hezekiah's reign, not long before the Assyrian invasion of the northern kingdom around 700 B.C. This reveals the first problem we have with promises like this. That is, they take so long to be fulfilled for us to see them being fulfilled. That's the the problem. The God of the universe took 700 years before he even began to, to fulfill this promise when Christ came. I say this because Peter says that the coming of the Holy Spirit on the church would happen in the last days. It's almost the exact same phrase, okay, in the latter days, all right, Acts 2, 17. In Hebrews, it's written, Christ has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself, Hebrews 9, 26. It appears that the latter times were really the end of the old creation and the beginning of the new creation in Christ. So we have been in the latter days for 2,000 years, okay? Now here's a theologian, he's nodding yes, okay? So he he agrees with me, that's a good sign. (laughs) So, because you see, uh, I went, my my, uh, seminary was the Harvard of Brazos County, where Slim graduated from. You don't know what that is, okay. You can ask later, all right? But God gave his people 700 years to prepare for the latter days. Part of why we have a hard time believing Micah 4 is that we did not have to go through those 700 years, so we're eschatologically spoiled. We're spoiled. You know, we think, oh, this, this, this thing takes so long. Well, hey, we're after Christ. You know, what do you think the prophets felt like? And during wars that seem to be ruining everything you've worked for, For 30 years, Micah 4 is simply, it appears, not true. But like Dr. King preaching a great vision of racial equality from the prophets when the whole country was weighed down by racial inequality, I feel the need to hear Micah 4 more than ever. So I'm just preaching to myself. I'm trying to comfort myself, okay? You see, Micah himself had to feel this way. Just before this passage, we see the moral state of the people Micah was prophesying to. Micah 3 reads... Verse 9, hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who detest justice. Look at that. That's, that's the moral environment he was preaching. That's where he was preaching. He was confronting people that detested justice. And make crooked all that is straight, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Its heads give judgment for a bride. It's bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money, yet they lean on the Lord. Look at there. Look at there. They're doing all this injustice to their neighbor, and yet they're very religious. Is not the Lord in our midst, they were saying. No disaster shall overcome us. And then verse 12. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. And Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins. The mountain of the house of the Lord, a wooded height. So the temple would become a forest, okay? And this is, you know, wild animals. And when they say a forest, you're talking about a scary, uh, wild place. Micah himself was in the valley of moral death when he was prophesying about the mountaintop of life, just like Dr. King was. So today I'm preaching to myself. I'm trying to take the long view on what is going on in Russia, Ukraine, or in Ukraine, because of Russia, so that I will not lose hope about the church. You can hear, oh, there you go. (laughs) I I was going to brag that you could hear me anyway, but okay. (laughs) I have had people jump almost out of their pews before when they had a real sensitive microphone, so... Anyway, if I scared you, all right, that's, that's my gift. We must believe God for Micah 4 even when we are living in Micah 3, or even if we feel like we're living in Micah 3, okay? Maybe you feel like, especially when you have things like George Floyd happen, and then you have, you know, on an infinitely greater scale, you have 
uh, Ukraine get in invaded. So uh, we have to believe God for Micah 4 even when we're living in Micah 3. The second C, the characters of the dream. Here I only want to make two observations. First, the mountain of the house of the Lord, Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 3.15, is the church. You have to understand what, what he's talking about in this passage is the church, the mountain of the house of the Lord. That's us right here, right now. In 4.3, we heard that nations shall not rise up sword against nation. In the Greek version of this, it reads, ethnos ep ethnos, the sword will not rise up. Ethnos can be translated culture. It's translated nation, it's translated all sorts of things, but it can also mean culture. One culture will not raise the sword against another culture. This is the incredible promise that one ethnic group will quit bullying another ethnic group. Now look at the end of verse 1. People shall flow to it, and then verse 2, many nations shall come. And this is where we see uh, the, the picture, what's pictured here are little streams of different people groups flowing where? To the mountain of the house of the Lord, to the church. And so God, God right here is, if you want to look for the word multi-ethnic, it's right there. Many nations is ethnos polos, multi-ethnic, or ethnic many, multi, all right? So if you're looking for the idea in literal terms of multi-ethnic churches or church, you have to just, it's right here. It's in Micah. Now, one of the reasons God loves diversity is because it's funny. It's funny. You say, well, how in the world is it funny? Well, I, I, I tell you, I, God called us to move to Russia so I could entertain the Russians with my Russian. I speak fluent Aggie slash cowboy Russian. <laughs> and so what does that mean? It means if they don't understand you, you just say it louder. It really works. So I was, uh, I had... Uh, I had, I took our Russian students in 1993 in my big red Texas Suburban, the only Suburban in St. Petersburg, five million people, fire engine red just to hide in the crowd, right? And as usual, the police pull me over, and uh, you're supposed to have one person per seat belt, one person per seat belt. I had 10 students in the car and three kids, three of my own kids in the back seat. So I was only about twice the seat belt limit. And usually they would extort money from you, five to, five to ten dollars, not much. So the, but I always got nervous when they pulled me over because I don't like being extorted. I don't know about you, but extortion is just not what I like. So they, they, pull, they pull us over, and I'm nervous, and he looks in the car and says, who are all these people? I said, well, <clears throat> I kind of blanked out. I said, well, they're my kids. <laughs> you know? Children that big. I had three little kids in the back, but you couldn't hardly see them in the crowd, right? He goes, your kids, what are you going to do with them? The policeman did, says that. And I said, ya idu damoy ibudit kushit ich. You got it? Ya idu damoy kushit ich. I was supposed to say, ya idu damoy i karmit. Kushit karmit. You see, it's almost the same thing in Texan. It's almost the same word. What, you know what I said to him? He said, what are you going to do with all those kids? I said, I'm going to take them home and eat them. <laughs> okay? Now, the word kushit is to eat, but I thought I was saying karmit, which is to feed. I meant to say to feed them. I'm not a cannibal, okay? <laughs> and so, so, I, so God's great. God is great. So instead of finding me, he, he jumped back and said, ah, get out of here. <laughs> no, that's the power of God right there. All right, so the first reason God loves diversity is because God's, God loves to have that kind of thing happen in a different language. And so you'll have, if you have a multi-ethnic church, that kind of thing will happen. Great, funny things will happen. But right here is also where God speaks churches like Mosaic into existence, okay? This is his dream, and he makes it happen. The people shall flow to Jerusalem in Mount Zion, a picture of a river of people melding together, all cultures flowing into God's house. We have to see this because this is God's dream for the church. All churches are to be as multi-ethnic as possible. 
All churches on the face of the earth should represent their community. Okay? And this, where do you go for that? You go to Micah 4, 1 through 7. And yet, when they come together, they are not to raise the sword on each other. This is one little caveat God has there. Come together and not try to kill each other, morally or literally. Micah 4 describes our natural state. We have emotional, moral, historic, and material swords we sharpen to raise on each other. And when by a miracle of the Spirit and the blood of Christ, we get together and don't kill each other, metaphorically or otherwise, the whole world sees the impossible has happened, and they want some of that. John 17, I didn't put it in the slides, but look at John 17. So you all are, you all are barking up the right tree, okay? Don't lose the vision. Don't give up. And God is challenging us in Russia with this exact same vision. Our seminary has a Ukrainian professor in it. He's the one with the beard. Let me step out here real quick. Is the slide up there? There you go. The one with the beard is from the Ukraine. Now you go to the left, and the dark-haired one in front of the man with a light blue shirt is Vanya, and that's Sergei, the Ukrainian. God has put them together in our seminary. <clears throat> He became, uh, Vanya, the one in the sweater in the middle, became good friends with Sergei, the professor. A month ago, Sergei texted Vanya that his neighborhood, where he lives with his wife and small baby, were being shelled by artillery. Can you imagine? I should have had a napkin up here to dab my eyes. Can you imagine? Your, your seminary professor is from the Ukraine, and he texts you and says, your army, your government's army, is hitting my neighborhood with artillery shells right now. So Vanya and another young couple in our church, the one we started in St. Petersburg, went out immediately and protested the war. All three of them were arrested because in Russia you cannot protest anything without being arrested. So Vanya, who has a wife and two kids, was in jail for two days the other ones were released pretty quickly, the young couple. He did this because of his love for Sergei and his wife and baby. I'll tell you what, I'm going to take this other one. <laughs> when the church is most the church, we have people of different races and cultures. And yet, as in Romans 12 and similar places, we are called to suffer with those who suffer. Sergei and his church and his nation are suffering. In fact, Sergei's whole church of 75, 000, 75 people has now moved to western Ukraine, the whole church. Can you imagine? It'd be like y'all up, uprooting here and moving, moving to New Mexico or something. All of them. So his whole church has had to move. And now, all of our churches in Russia are given the challenge, will they suffer with those who suffer? Romans 12, suffer with those who suffer. So now they're in the valley of decision. Will they suffer with them? Which... You know, there could be various ways of suffering with them. But we have to see that these kind of cross-cultural mixes are exactly what God wants in his Mount Zion. God wants us to have to face the reality of those who are different from us and suffer more from us in, in this life than they do. He does not want a false peace in his church by everyone being the same, especially on important issues of life. He wants a peace that comes about through what we see in the next point, a costly peace. Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And guess what? That's talking about swords, okay? When swords hit each other, what, what happens? <laughs> what happens? Sparks fly. That's right. And therefore, the... Uh, the challenge that I'm in the middle of, I just met Friday morning with our presbytery, our Russian presbytery, and we're sort of taking baby steps toward dealing with this morally. And uh, I, I, I'm just, I'm just kind of walking them through that. So pray, pray for me for two things. I'm helping these 25 churches uh, deal with the reality of the war. We're taking baby steps for them to be able to do that. 
And secondly, I'm about to go there. So pray for both things. Pray that God will help me in leading this uh, process of them. You see, they get propaganda constantly that this war is justifiable. And so they're in a very, very hard place morally. But pray for my trip there. I'll be there for three or four weeks, uh, just in a few weeks. And also pray for my leadership of these guys, because right now uh, they, they need the leadership. The third C, the calling of the dream. Here I want to make quick, some quick four observations. Again, not more than an hour on each observation. Micah 4, what is the one calling of the church on the earth today? To have the law of Christ and the word of, uh, the word of God to sound forth from her in such a powerful and life-transforming way that all men and women beat their swords into plowshares and study war no more. Swords and plowshares here represent public morality. It says there that the house of God will become the, might, the highest of the hills, the highest of the mountains. And so instead of thinking in terms, Micah 4 is one of those passages, it doesn't allow for private Christianity, okay? Micah 4 says that the church becomes the most influential power on the earth through preaching of the Word of God, okay? We're to be the most powerful influence on the face of the earth. That's the calling of Micah 4. And so it's not all about my individual salvation. And then the second observation is Micah 6. In Micah 6, 8, we see, we see, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you. Maybe you've heard this verse before. I don't know, Mosaic, have you heard this verse? But to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. You see, the God, the, the Jesus, this, actually Jesus is presented to us in this, in this uh, book. The Jesus of Micah is the God who says, what does it look like to walk humbly with God? It means in public you work for mercy and justice. The problem with the church throughout 2,000 years is we divide it up and think you can walk humbly with God and not work for public peace and public mercy. That's the problem. In Micah, Mike, the book of Micah is having none of it. And so when my father in 1964 voted against the Civil Rights Act, was he walking humbly with God when he did that? No, he wasn't. In fact, it, Later on, he admitted it. He basically repented in 1968 and came to Christ for real. He was a Presbyterian, but he wasn't walking with God. <laughs> he, you can, I hate to tell you, but you can be a Presbyterian. <laughs> I know it's news. I know it's news. I know it shocks you. Some of you are going to lose consciousness. But you can be a Presbyterian and not walk humbly with God because you are not willing to go out in public and work for mercy and justice. And then the final, uh, the final two C's are the cost. What is the cost? <clears throat> I'll have to, uh, you'll have to skip one passage here, but the, the, the people who come to the Lord in Micah 4, 6, and 7 are not maybe who we think. It is the lame and the outcasts. How does God build his church? With the lame and the outcasts. You say, well, pastor, you look like you walk pretty well. But we can only come to Christ when we see that before God we're lame and we're outcasts. We're outcasts from him. And so the men that I work with in Russia, they're all former convicts, almost all, and former drug addicts, believe it or not. So our, our whole ministry is Micah 4, 6, and 7. But what is the cost of this? Well... The cost is Matthew 7. What does it cost for me? Matthew 7 says, you must first take the uh, log out of your own eye before you take the speck out of your brother's eye. So guess what I've had to say? Now, I am a former infantry captain, and my son served six months in Afghanistan. But guess what I've had to do to be able to talk to them meaningfully about this war? They say that our invasion, the American invasion of Iraq, 
was just like this invasion of Ukraine. And of course, it's a good American. Oh, it can't be. It can't. In fact, just the other day, I said, well, there's a nuance of difference. He said, no, there's not. <laughs> so I have had to take the log out of my own eye, lay down my sword before I expected them to take the log out of their eye. I've had to tell them, you know what, if you look at it from an outsider's perspective, the invasion of Iraq, Iraq that caused a million deaths is essentially the equivalent. It's just that it's not, it's not our neighbor. It's not Canada. You know, there's kind of a, there's the equivalent of us invading Canada. So the cost has been cultural humility, taking the log out of my own eye about what my own nation does. Okay? If you can't do it, Jesus says you're a hypocrite. All right? And I'm not, again, <laughs> I'm a former uh, <laughs> infantry captain. All right? I'm not against the military per se. In many ways, I'm very proud of some of our Christian traditions in the military, and I'm very proud of some of the good wars, perhaps, we work, worked in. So that's been the cost for me. But the final, the final uh, C is the cross. And I want you to look at Micah uh, 4, 1. For it says, with a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. And then in verse 2, who is the judge of Israel? It's the one who was born in Bethlehem. And finally in verse 5, and he, Jesus, shall be their peace. You know why long-term peace only works through Christ? He shall be their peace. Jesus shall be their shalom. You see, you cannot take the cultural log out of your own eye because if you do, that's your identity. Until you have the shalom of Jesus Christ ruling in your heart, you cannot lose your cultural identity. You'll feel naked. You can't do it. Our brothers here have tried to help people in our area do that. It didn't work. Until we have the deep shalom of Jesus in our eyes, we cannot beat our swords into plowshares. We can't do it. No one does that long term. So our hope is not in our nuclear arsenal. Our hope is not in uh, our army or our navy or our air force. Our hope is in verse 5, and he shall be their peace. At the end of, uh, of my Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. King's message, he said, and they'll make the crooked ways straight. And so God's long-term dream and the dream he has for you and I today is to leave here and make our own crooked hearts straight through Christ and to go into the world and make the world's crooked ways straight through Jesus Christ. That's the calling of Micah, and that's your and I's calling today. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.